Welcome again. Right now we're at Romans chapter 4, Paul versus James, okay? We're going to read Romans chapter 4, and then we're going to read a little portion of James, because you see, many scholars believe that the book of James was written after the book of Romans, and that James was writing his epistle in reply to Paul, or as a rebuttal to Paul. So this is going to be interesting. Let's get into it. What then will we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not toward God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And that is found in Genesis 15, verse 6. I find it quite notable that Paul bases his faith doctrine on the writings of Moses, on the books of Moses, on the what the Jews would call the Torah. Now to him who works, the reward is not counted as grace, in other words, as a gift, but as something owed. But to him who doesn't work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, hint, hint, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Even as David, oh, he brings David in the scene here. Oh, even as David also pronounces blessing on the man to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Now, as I read this, I want you to ask a question. How does Paul gather that David is talking about grace versus works here? Quote, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord will by no means charge with sin. And that is found in Psalm 32, verse 1 to 2. Well, since that Paul brings out the writings of David to prove his point, I think it's very important for us to understand what David actually said about how and why sin is forgiven. Let's go right on over to Psalm 32, the very same psalm that Paul quoted. Blessed is he whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom Yahweh, or Yahuwah, doesn't impute iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now, if you just skip on down here just a few verses, you will see why God forgave David's sin. He said, I acknowledged my sin to you and didn't hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions. I will confess my transgressions to Yahuwah, Yahweh. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. See, God did not forgive David until he confessed. He confessed his iniquity. Now, confession, to actually confess iniquity, uh, doesn't that sound like a little bit of a work, something that you actually do, something that you actually perform, uh, some kind of a little bit of a human involvement there, you actually confess your iniquity. And you see, this is how God works. Go on over to Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. He who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. It doesn't say whoever just believes, just believes. Now, in just a few minutes, we're going to see what James says about this, okay? But first of all, let's hear Paul out. Let's go back on over to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 here, verse 9. Is this blessing then pronounced on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it counted? when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. He received the sign of circumcision, a seal, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while he was in uncircumcision. Think about that for a minute. He received the sign. In other words, Paul's like, listen, see, look, God had enough grace on Abraham to show him that he must get circumcised while he was uncircumcised. You see what Paul's saying here? It's almost like what comes first, the chicken or the egg with Paul. Now think about this for a second. Circumcision, i.e. obeying the Torah, is a seal of the righteousness of faith. Okay, so, I mean, don't you want your faith sealed? 
<laughs> you got to do it through obedience. That he might be a father of all those who believe, though they might be in uncircumcision, that righteousness might be accounted to them. He is the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had in uncircumcision. For the promise to Abraham and to his offspring that he should be heir of the world wasn't through the law, through the Torah, although uh, ironically this is written in what the Jews would call the Torah, Genesis, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void, and the promise is made of no effect. For the law produces wrath, for where there is no law, neither is there disobedience. It's kind of like, you know, if a tree fell in the forest and nobody was there to hear it, did it still make a sound? Like if someone committed a crime and there was no law against it, is it still a crime? For this cause it is of faith that it may be according to grace to the end that the promise may be sure to all the offspring, not to that only which is of the law. Notice it says not to that only which is of the law. In other words, it is of the law. But to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. And again, he quotes the Torah, Genesis chapter 17 verse 5. This is in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls the things that are not as though they were. Besides hope, Abraham and hope believed, to the end that he might become a father of many nations, according to that which had been spoken, so will your offspring be. Again, Genesis chapter 15 verse 5. Without being weakened in faith, he didn't consider his own body already having been worn out. He was being about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, looking to the promise of God, he didn't waver through unbelief, but grew strong through faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Therefore, it also was credited to him for righteousness. Again, Paul quotes the Torah, Genesis 15, 6. Now it was not written that it was accounted to him for his sake alone, but for our sake also, to whom it will be accounted, who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. Most people, when they read that, most pastors, most Christian leaders, most Bible school teachers says, that tells you right there, it's got nothing to do with anybody's works. It's got nothing to do with any human effort at all. God forbid, it's all God. And you just have to believe, you just have to receive. It's just all God. It's got nothing to do with human works or else somebody would have some kind of thing to boast about. We don't, we don't want you to boast or anybody else to boast because it's got nothing to do with human works. Now think about it for a minute. Those people who go to churches, who believe that if you go forward and say the sinner's prayer and say, God, I'm sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. They believe they're saved. Okay. Uh, are you trying to tell me that you got saved by absolutely no works whatsoever? Are you implying that there was no human work involved at all in printing the Bible, studying the Bible? preaching the Bible, clicking, tapping, or going to meetings, listening and understanding and responding to the message. Listen, it takes a lot of work from a lot of people. Also note how Paul drafted his entire doctrine of grace based upon the quote unquote Old Testament. Consider who Paul is, okay? This is the problem with having all of the books put together, compiled in one thing called the Bible, because it makes you want to treat everything written between these two covers equally. But that is not how they did it in Jesus' day. And Jesus had no problem with it. They had the Torah kept separately than the book of Isaiah. They had every scroll kept in a different place and every scroll 
maintained its own individuality. And that's the key there. For each book to maintain its individuality so that you understand who wrote it and what authority that author has. And not every author has the same authority. Isaiah didn't have the same authority as Moses. That is clear in Numbers chapter 12. Moses had much more authority. God said, I speak to Moses face to face. I show him everything plainly. I don't show any of the other prophets that, like not like that. No, I show them in riddles and dreams and visions and in all kinds of different indirect ways. But Moses, he gets it face to face in power and public glory. You got to ask this question. Who was Paul anyway? Just who was he anyway? He was a Pharisee who was taught by Gamaliel from the school of Hillel, and he persecuted people who believed in Yeshua, Hamashiach. He wasn't part of the 12. Jesus did not handpick him as part of the 12. Just a Pharisee. On his way to persecute the believers, Jesus knocked him off his high horse, and he became a believer, and Jesus sent him to the Gentiles. Now, apart from Paul's knowledge of the culture, and him coming into the scene shortly after the fact, after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension, and him being included in the book of Acts. Apart from that, he is very much like a lot of people today who have had great and dramatic, life-changing experiences with the Lord. There are some people today who've had really powerful experiences with Jesus, but they've never walked and talked with Jesus in the flesh, just like Paul. He had a powerful experience with Jesus, but he never walked and talked with Jesus in the flesh. Now compare Paul with James. James was part of the 12. Not only was he part of the real 12, but he was part of the inner circle. One of the few men that went everywhere Jesus went. James got to see and hear things and learn things that not even all the apostles got to see and hear. Jesus kept Peter, James, and John closer than anybody else. He could have chose Paul. Jesus could have chose Paul to be part of the inner circle. He didn't. Paul had to answer to James in Acts chapter 21. Spiritually speaking, on the ladder of authority in the Lord, we've got Peter, James, and John at the top, the other nine, and then we've got Paul underneath. James is far more advanced in knowledge than Paul. Let's go see what James has to say about Abraham, faith, and works. This is James chapter 2, verse 19. James says, you believe that God is one? Good for you. You do well. The demons, the evil spirits also believe and shudder. James was saying, you believe? Even the evil spirits believe what makes you better than them. But do you want to know, vain man, that faith apart from works is dead? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works? Whoa, ho, ho, ho. this is diametrically opposed to the idea that it's by faith, not by works. Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works in that he offered up Isaac, his son on the altar? You see that faith worked with his works and by works, faith was perfected. What did we learn so far from James? Faith without works is dead, okay? And I'm telling you, dead faith won't get you an inch toward heaven. And by faith, works was perfected. In other words, if you don't have works and all you got is faith and grace and so on and so forth, if you don't have works, you have imperfect faith. Do you think that God's gonna be pleased with imperfect faith? Verse 23, so the scripture was fulfilled, which says... Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Wow, see how James took a completely different interpretation out of that verse than Paul did. Paul quoted the same verse to back up his grace doctrine, whereas James quoted that same verse to prove that you got to have works. And he, talking about Abraham, was called the friend of God. You see then that by works, a man is justified, not only by faith. Thank you, James. In the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified <coughs> by, by, by faith? No, excuse me, by works? By works. 
in that she received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, even so faith apart from works is dead. Wow. Paul versus James. Listen, if Paul says anything against Jesus, Peter, James, or John, or Moses, or Isaiah for that matter, or pretty much any other prophet in the Old Testament, so-called Old Testament, move on over, Paul. You're not a prophet. You're not the Lord. You're not part of the 12. You're not part of the inner circle. And in the next few chapters of Romans, we're talking about Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8, this is going to be awesome because we are going to find out exactly what Paul's talking about here. See, if you do not understand the ways of God, if you do not know the entire scope of Scripture and how it applies to us today, it's, it's hard to understand Paul, you see. In Romans chapter 2, he says, the doers of the law are justified. And then it seems like he says, well, not by works of the law, we're not justified. We're justified by grace alone, by faith, not by works. It's got nothing to do with law, no law at all. Then he comes along and he says, if you do this, that, and the other thing, you're going to hell. Sounds like a law to me. We are going to tackle this and it is going to be awesome. Until next time, seek God with all your heart. And if you do, you will find him. Call upon him and he will show you great and mighty things. Love you guys.